Baroque architecture follows different laws from those of antiquity and the Renaissance. Gone is the stately equilibrium and logic. Instead, the framework seems to move, the boundaries seem to melt and walls to dance. The very stone seems to bend itself to the will of the architect. The most willful architect of them all was Francesco Borromini. Sant'Ivo della Sapienza is Borromini's masterpiece. His architecture is intellectually complex, a startling amalgam of mathematics and fantasy. He knew the history of architecture and drew upon the past boldly and freely. The facade curves in, but the dome above it curves out, presenting the beholder with a dramatic contrast. Using a symmetry so odd that it seems almost asymmetrical, he opposes convex and concave arcs. The result is that the building itself seems to be alive and pulsating. Borromini's work emphasized one of the central teachings of the Roman Catholic Church in the 17th century. Salvation could not be attained by reason alone, nor by simple sensual experience. It required an imaginative leap of faith. In bewildering the eye and challenging the mind, Borromini sought to plunge the worshipper into the mystery of salvation. Not everyone understood. A contemporary critic wrote, everyone gets in his head a new idea and displays it in public squares and upon facades, madly deforming buildings and even towns. But an official of Borromini's Church of San Carlo recorded, nothing similar with regard to artistic merit can be found anywhere in the world. Members of different nations arrive daily in Rome and try to procure plans of the church. We've been asked for them by Germans, Flemings, Frenchmen, Spaniards, and even Indians. The Baroque style in architecture that had its roots in Counter-Reformation Rome spread north into war-torn Germany and Austria. During most of the 17th century, Austria was preoccupied with its lonely fight against the encroaching armies of the Ottoman Turks. When the Austrians defeated the Muslim Turks at the gates of Vienna in 1683, a new era began. The Habsburg Holy Roman Emperors turned to rebuilding their ravaged land. All along the Danube, where bleak fortresses had guarded the river, a chain of magnificent abbeys was built. The victory over the Turks meant that money was now available for grand enterprises. The monks' taxes paid for buildings rather than for weapons. These abbeys were meant to serve not only as religious communities, but also as hospices for the emperor. St. Florian's Abbey, begun in 1689, is the work of an Italian and an Austrian, Carlo Carloni and Jacob Prantal. In true Baroque fashion, the new abbey was a stage upon which royal ritual could be played out by the visiting emperor. Paradoxically, the stage usually lacked its leading actor, for the emperor himself rarely visited any of the abbeys. But it didn't matter. The object was not imperial housing. It was to make a political point. To bear witness to the unity of Christianity and empire. Here we're dealing not with the glorification of an individual emperor, but with the need to assert the divine right to rule of an institution, the Habsburg Empire. Newly victorious over the Turks, the Austrians believe themselves to be the saviors of Christian Europe. They proclaim their triumph in their art and in their architecture. The Karlskirche, or Charles Church in Vienna, is an example of the power of the Christian faith to absorb and transfigure many influences. The gabled portico reminds us of the Pantheon. The columns suggest Trajan's column in Imperial Rome, as well as the Bible's description of Solomon's temple. The dome is like the domes of Papal Rome. At the ends of the building, the two towers suggest an Imperial fortress. 
Begun in 1716, the Charles Church is the work of Fischer von Erlach, who studied the work of Bernini and Borromini in Rome. It's dedicated to Charles Borromeo, one of the great Counter-Reformation saints. It is not a coincidence that the Austrian emperor at the time was also named Charles. For in the lands where absolute monarchs ruled, architecture was part of the vocabulary of royal power. The Belvedere Palace in Vienna was built in 1721 for Prince Eugene of Savoy, the general who led the Austrians to their victory over the Turks. The architect was Lucas von Hildebrandt. The Belvedere actually consists of two palaces set at opposite ends of an enormous formal garden in which nature has been completely subdued. The design is based on a simple program. Together, the two palaces and the garden present the visitor with an allegory of life's journey. At one end, where Prince Eugene lived, is the lower Belvedere and its gardens, representing the earth. At the other end, where visitors were received, the upper Belvedere, are the heavens. At first, you think you can go directly to the palace. The path appears straight but you find that you cannot. The grand staircase in the center of the garden reveals itself as you approach to be a cascade, water. You must go to the left or to the right. The garden forces you to be a player in an allegory of the human journey to eternity. The palace faces north, so there's always a shadow on its facade. Like the heaven it represents, you can't read its features until you're very close. As you arrive at the entrance hall of the upper Belvedere, you're reminded that you may have to struggle like Hercules to stay on the right path. At last, the grand staircase brings you to the hall of the emperor. In the end, the journey is worth taking, for if you proceed correctly, you arrive at your goal. This has not been a dismal journey. It has taken place, after all, in a garden. A reminder that the earth can be a happy place, at least for the privileged few who might find themselves here as the guests of Prince Eugene.